Welcome to this house of worship. We're delighted and honored uh, that you would be with us today in your house of worship, wherever that is for you. You know, this is uh, a sanctuary that's built for 1,100 people. And uh, I think we're six of us here today, five or six. And so uh, you can't see it at this point, but there's a lot of space here that appears empty. Uh, although we know that there are presences, saints unseen in the building as well. But to the naked eye, it's uh, an empty space. And uh, so we often imagine and wonder where you are and, and how it is that we can see you when uh, you're not able to be with us. Well, this week uh, we, got, we received a little video of one of our worship partners. Uh, He's three years old, his name is Justin, and uh, this gives us some sense of people who are with us in this time. So we'd like for you to see this video of Justin and of his participation in the worship. Take a look. Well, we hope you won't be shy to sing along with the music or hum, uh, because uh, Justin is an inspiration for all of us with his, his concentration and his affirmation at the end. So thank you, Justin. Um, our, our team is assembled, and uh, we're very proud uh, of them and very grateful to them. Uh, Dr. John uh, LaRue is here behind the camera. Uh, Doug Berstow is back there at the soundboard. Uh, Joan McDonald, thank you to you for your beautiful reading. Uh, my colleague uh, Ellen Berstow is here. My name is Peter Short. And our musical team, uh, Steve Peacock, Margaret McDonald on the organ, and uh, Heather Neville uh, providing vocals. And so to you folks, uh, we say thank you, God bless you, and to all of you who are with us today, may there be a blessing for you, and thank you for your presence. Let us build a house where love can dwell, and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell, our hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Hear the love of Christ shall end division. i <laughs> 
Let us pray. Generous and loving God, as we gather together this day across the city and beyond us, flow through us that we might sense your presence, your strength, your support. Help us to discern the path to travel. Love us that we might become who you call us to be. Be with us this day as we join our voices, our hearts with people everywhere, knowing that we are not alone. We ask this in the name of our brother Jesus. Amen. Hello, boys and girls. It's so good to be back and to see you again. I can imagine each of you sitting somewhere in the sanctuary. And so I'm going to have homework for you to do today, but first I want to tell you a story. I want to turn the pages of time back to when Jesus was a little boy. When he was born, there was great excitement. And for the first number of years, they worked very hard to teach Jesus the Aramaic language. And then, when he was about five years old, it was time for him to go to school. We don't know much of the story, but we do know what they did in Jesus' time. And we think perhaps he followed that line. His dad would have taken him to school. The school would have been attached to the synagogue. His church, the Jewish church, is called the synagogue, their place of worship. And he would have gone absolutely every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, seven days a week to study. And he would have had a scroll and they would have opened it up, and the words in the scroll would have been the words of Torah, the first books of our Bible. There would have been stories of prophets, and they would have taught Jesus and his friends all about it. They taught him the alphabet, and not only did they teach him his alphabet frontwards, but also backwards. So if his alphabet was our alphabet, it would be like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or ZYX, WV, UTS, and RQP. That's what he would learn. It was about memorizing. It was about looking at the scriptures and knowing what they said. He learned Hebrew at school. He would have gone to school for 13 years. or I'm sorry, until he was 13 years old. And then when he was 13, he and his friends would decide what they were going to do. Some some would have gone on to study. Some would have learned a trade from their dad. Some of them would have had different travels and different journeys. We know that when Jesus was 12, he went to the synagogue and he amazed the people at how much he knew. We know a lot about when he became grown up and taught us so much. But we don't know a lot about him going to school. We only know what happened in his day. Now, beside me is a desk, because I know that this week was the week that you began school. This desk sitting here was the desk that my father and Doug, who was doing the sound, his father, they used that when they were a little boy to study. It was in their house, and they would have sat at that desk to study. It's over 100 years old. But inside it, I have things that show you how life has changed. When I open it up, when you went to school, now you have to take a water bottle. There are no more water fountains. You need to fill your bottle, and you have to drink out of your own bottle. You have to wear a mask, and I bet you have lovely masks, and you have more than one of them. They didn't wear them in Jesus' day, and they didn't wear them in my father's day or my day. And you would have had, not the scroll, but somebody in your family, oops, would have had a computer. And all the time in the last six months, the computer would have been opened, and you would have learned from it. And for those people who don't have a computer, they're working very hard so that every home has a computer. Life has changed, but some of the things have remained the same. It's important to learn, it's important to listen, and it's important to be kind to one another. Now your homework. This week I want you to send me 
a picture of your first day of school. It can be a picture of you or your family, whatever picture was taken, or it can be a picture you draw of your first day of school. And somebody will send it to me so that I can have a look at it. See you next week. Bye-bye. This prayer will be offered in music and in words. We begin with verse one of the hymn, Come Down, O Love Divine. This is a, a hymn from Italy, 14th century, which places it in time and place with the bubonic plague. It is uh, an invitation to the Holy Spirit. Come down, O love divine, seek thou this soul of mine, and visit it with thine own ardor glowing. The hymn will then move from the sung word to the spoken word, and we will acknowledge that we may pray for the presence of the Spirit, but there's not always room at the inn. There's not always space for the settling of grace within us. And so we acknowledge that, and we ask forgiveness, and we ask for newness of life and the restoration of heart and soul for our living. Then the prayer will conclude again with music, ending with the words, none can guess the grace until love creates the place wherein the Holy Spirit makes her dwelling. Let us pray. Spirit, fire of truth and wind of grace, comfort in human distress. The heart would welcome you, the mind would invite you in, the soul would offer you hospitality, if only there were room, space for you to enter and live. But the heart chokes on these old resentments. The mind is suffocating under the weight of cultural junk, and the soul no longer heard has fallen silent. Forgive us. Help us to make space, to let go of what possesses us, heart, mind, and soul, until we are emptied and there is place for you, and we can begin again, begin to live in your grace, Restored, forgiven, we live again.
The Old Testament reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 19 to 31. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall on the right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them. All of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at the dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. The New Testament reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. Welcome to those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand tall or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in the honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do, not, we do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. This is the witness that has been passed down to us, thanks be to God. 
Sunday, September 13th. This is a good day for a conversation, if we can imagine a conversation between two calendars. One calendar is the Christian liturgical calendar, and on that calendar today is the 15th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. It is also the first in creation time. It's called creation time one. And creation time is a sector, a new sector of the season of Pentecost in which we focus on the creation of God, its integrity and its well-being. The other calendar is the calendar that is commonly used in the society. It's in all our homes. It's the one that begins on January the 1st. And according to that calendar, today is Grandparents' Day. Yes. It's also the eve of the New Brunswick provincial election. This will be the 40th election since Confederation. Of course, human history was being lived here in this valley 10,000 years before anyone ever dreamed of Confederation, a fact that creation time helps us to recognize. So, one single day, but two calendars, two points of view, two ways of looking at a day. This is a conversation, something to think about on election eve. Now, Elections New Brunswick is the organization that will ensure that the vote is conducted in a manner that is safe, orderly, and reliable so that we, the voters, the citizens, may be confident in the result that it is an accurate reflection of the expressed will of the people. And at the same time, the other calendar, the lectionary, is taking us to a chaotic scene in the Old Testament book of Exodus. So here you have it. We citizens are lining up at the polling station, voting cards in hand, sanitizer on our fingers, masks on, following the lines, ready to place our X. And Exodus, at the same time, is drawing back the curtain on the scene of a dangerous and violent escape. The slaves are on their way out of servitude. You see, the church never lets you away with being a child of your own times. Just as our minds are begin beginning to be consumed by the election, by its cast of characters, its conflict amongst uh, political parties, its unknown outcome, our spiritual tradition is setting us down to listen to an ancient story of a people in hopeless servitude and their sudden liberation. The characters in that liberation are larger than life. The Pharaoh, most powerful man in the world, ruler of all Egypt, all Egypt's dominions. The Pharaoh does not hold elections. Facing the Pharaoh, nose to nose, Moses. Born into slavery, escaped murderer, spokesman of the oppressed, Moses does not take no for an answer. Following Moses, a band of escaped slaves who have an angel going ahead of them as a scout. Following the escaping slaves, a threatening army in pursuit, horses, chariots, all of it. And within all the dust and the confusion and the smoke and the noise and the terror, there is the unseen hand of the Lord. Equally alarming are the natural phenomena that accompany what's going on. There is a ferocious wind coming out of the east, so powerful it creates a kind of reverse storm surge in which a path is opened through the sea and the Israelites pass through, walking on the sea floor and on into the wilderness. They're guided by a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. 
I mean, the whole thing can only be described as fantastic. The rational mind would like to have an explanation of this, for example, traveling cloud by day, traveling fire by night. And there are such explanations. Here's one. In the ancient Middle East, long caravans used to travel in convoy through barren lands. The head of the caravan would carry a large basin of burning coals, and out of that basin there would arise columns of smoke, and so that all the caravans in the convoy could follow what was a pillar of cloud by day. And by the same token, at night, those burning coals would provide light of fire, a pillar of fire by night. But even with the rational explanations, the whole thing is still fantastic, which is a word, fantastic, sharing the same root as the word phantom, which means something visible. And what was fantastic, what was made visible was freedom. And in Pharaoh's land, freedom is an impossible miracle. So Psalm 114, which is also set for us in the lectionary today, describes this whole thing in a way that's even more fantastic than the story itself. Listen to this. When Israel went out of Egypt, the sea looked and fled. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why is it, O Lord, that the sea flees? Why, O mountains, that you skip like rams? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, who turns rock into a pool of water and flint into a spring. Miracle. It means wonder. Miracle. It is not a primitive attempt to circumvent science. Or let me put that this way. I know scientists who see miracles in what they study, even though they can give a perfectly rational explanation of what they're seeing. That's because miracle is wonder, and it lives in the heart. And freedom is an impossible miracle that lives in the heart of any person now free who once lived under the boot of slavery. And slavery has many boots. I don't have to tell you how this is true. The many boots of slavery, the ever new inventions of slavery, even now after all these years, As I said, there were no elections in Pharaoh's world. When we see a society where there are no elections, it helps us to recognize the nature and the blessing of our own society. As the poet says, what do they know of England who only England know? But if we see Pharaoh's land, we begin to understand what it means to have a society where elections are mandated on a regular basis by law. And it's because we have elections that makers of law in New Brunswick, no matter how powerful they might be, no matter how popular, no matter how charismatic, law, lawmakers in New Brunswick must, in their authority, be subjected on a regular basis to the authority of the people. In this democratic society, everybody is enfranchised. Everyone except the chief electoral officer of New Brunswick and the returning officer of every constituency. Everybody else is enfranchised, has the vote. The richest of the rich, the poorest of the poor. Men, women, people who identify as neither man nor woman or both. People driving Teslas, people standing by the side of the road in the rain hitchhiking, people serving a sentence in prison, people who have no home, everyone, the elated and the bereaved, 
the cream of the academy and the man learning how to read, one vote is as powerful as any other vote. As far as I can tell, Elections New Brunswick has no motto. It has no slogan. I find this odd. Every organization, even every product, seems to have a motto or a slogan. I know a church that identifies itself as the church in the heart of the city with the city at heart. That's a pretty cool motto. Uh, I think Starbucks has way too many mottos to count. Make your day more, uh, more delicious, one person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. Here are some slogans. They're making news right now. And let's see if you can guess what the six of these slogans have in common. New Brunswick is rising to the challenge. Working together. Common sense for the common good. Change you can believe in. The party with heart. Keep it simple solutions. If you guessed that those are, or if you knew that those are the mottos, the slogans of the six political parties in this provincial election, you're right, you're brilliant. Fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky, way to go. I'd like to make, though, a modest proposal. Elections New Brunswick should have a motto. It won't surprise you that I just happen to have one in hand. I found it in the epistle reading for today, Paul's letter to the Romans, 14th chapter. The, slogans for ele the slogan for elections New Brunswick is right there. Who are you to pass judgment? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, saith St. Paul. Okay, maybe it's a little heavy for popular consumption. I'm not much at branding, I know. But Paul is talking here about something that Elections New Brunswick values. All votes are welcome. And all votes are equal. And each vote carries the dignity of a human being. And each vote is worthy of respect. But Paul says that value this way. Some of us are vegan, some of us are carnivores. Some of us are consumers, some are abstainers. Some of us say all days are the same, others say no, some days are holy. But even Paul, so fierce in dedication to his cause, knew that our differences do not reach deep enough to erase the truth that we all stand in our common humanity before God. There it is. Who are you to pass judgment? For we will all pass before the judgment seat of God. Here's how Eugene Debs expressed that as he was being sentenced for trying to obstruct the draft for World War I. He said to the judge, Your Honor, years ago I recognized my kinship with all living beings. And I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then, and I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Here's the thing that Elections New Brunswick cannot do. Even though each vote is a recognition of human right and human dignity, even though each vote carries equal weight and power, even though no vote is better or stronger than any other, Elections New Brunswick cannot guarantee that the government elected will ensure the dignity and the right and the respect and the freedom of all people in this province. The wealthy will continue to get wealthier. 
the poor get poorer. Migrant workers whose labor feeds us are not citizens, while people who have no intention of living and working here can hold the Canadian passport. Some people have access to a family physician or basic health care. Many don't. Elections New Brunswick, for all its good work, can help us elect our leaders in a way that is just and accessible and equitable and fair. Thank God we're not in Pharaoh's land. But Elections New Brunswick cannot ensure that the government will enact laws and policies that are just, accessible, equitable, and fair. Elections New Brunswick could do its job, and I thank every one of the people whose work makes that possible. But when their work is done, that's when ours begins. You know who we are? We are the strange people who live by two calendars. While we are tuned in to the election on one calendar, we are remembering the miracle of freedom on another calendar. We carry this ancient story into the election, and this church carries it into the days beyond. And this is why we are committed to freedom, to safety, to sustenance, and to respect for all. Let's hear those party slogans one more time. Keep it simple solutions. The party with heart change you can believe in, common sense for the common good, working together. New Brunswick is rising to the challenge. God grant us the heart to believe it will be so. God grant us the courage to make it real in everything our church stands for and does. Let us take for our own election slogan, Paul's ancient and ever-living word, who are you to pass judgment? For we will all pass before the judgment seat of God. Amen. Each week, we stand here with an offering plate in hand. This plate is a symbol of the gifts, the givers, and the giving that sustains this church 
and its mission here in the city of Fredericton. Today, I'm remembering a teaching I received back in December. It was the Christmas season, and I was at uh, our Wednesday for Wilmot, Wednesdays at Wilmot gathering, which is uh, a gathering that is one of our uh, events that supports people of low income in the center of the city, offering them sustenance, community, and uh, offering them the staples of life. At any rate, at that uh, particular Wednesdays at Wilmot, we had a table set up with gifts. And many, many people in the congregation had uh, donated gifts to the table. And so the participants that day came to the table one by one, and they looked at what was on the table, and they chose a gift. And I was watching and listening. And time after time, person after person, they came up with a delight in their eyes and care very carefully chose something. But the thing is, they never chose anything for themselves. They always said, oh, my mother would love this, or my sister would love that. And so they would choose something, not for themselves, but for somebody else. And the teaching I received that day was how happy it makes a person to be able to give. How happy it makes us when we have the capacity, the, the ability, the resources, and the heart to give. And so giving is a part of our spiritual heritage here, a part of our spiritual vitality, and one of our roads to happiness. We thank you for your giving, for your support of Wilmot United Church and its mission, and may the teach that teaching find its place in your life and heart as well. Thank you. Amen. Please join me in the prayers of the people. With these prayers, we as a far-reaching community ask for God's loving presence in the church, the world, the community, and our lives. We come with what is in our hearts this day. Let us pray. O Holy One, we come before you in prayer remembering who we are and whose we are. We give thanks that we are part of a community that has a wonderful story of love and faithfulness, forgiveness and sharing. O oh God, creator of all that is, the sun, the moon, the stars, and for all that dwells here on earth, we give thanks. We give thanks for your son, Jesus, the light of the world. We pray most humbly to reflect his light as we go about our lives in the coming week. We are so aware of the many of our world who suffer, some here in our own community and others around the world, many suffering in silence in hopes that a helping hand may be extended their way. Our thoughts and prayers are with them. We pray for the family and friends who are grieving the loss of loved ones through disease, through accidents, and at times through violence. We pray for our children, our youth, for teachers and custodians, for university and college students and all of the staff who serve in the educational settings as we open the doors after six long months. It is such a difficult time, so we ask also that you will be with the families. May the days and the weeks ahead see the measures taken to protect all show promise. We pray for our world, those who are caught in the midst of war that are not of their own making, those flee in their homes in search of a safe place to live, those who face racism each and every day, those who are hungry and malnourished, as well as those who have no home. We pray for those who are dealing with the destruction brought on by hurricanes, floods, and for those who remain in the path of such winds. And this day, we pray for those battling wildfires across Canada and around the world. 
our thoughts and prayers go out to all. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, lost their homes, their livelihood. We pray for those who are the frontline workers taking such risks, especially for those fighting the fires in California. Fast moving wildfires, leaving less time for warnings or evacuations. Our thoughts and our prayers are with them. Compassionate God, we pray for those in our own community who are in need, those who face homelessness, job loss, loneliness, grief and illness. And we pause for a moment to ask a special blessing upon those we know and name now in the silence of our hearts. O oh God, hear our prayers. Help us to find hope in that vision of a community where each of us will work towards seeing the world, the entire world, through the eyes of our hearts. This we pray in the name of our brother Jesus. Amen. And so the worship is over. The service begins. Thank you for being with us. And until we meet again, go in peace. And may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Creator, the Christ, and the Spirit go with you on your journey all the way. Amen.